adjustable shaft must be impervious to weather and not made of metal at least not the tube which connects the search coil as it is too close and it will interfere you should be able to slide the tube inside another shaft without side to side slop and be able to ad be adjusted and locked into position it must also be very light and may in fact have to be reinforced in some places it must also be paintable the detector shaft and stem should be reinforced in three places one at the end of the adjustable shaft to allow for the bolt and nut two the handle or grip for the straight shaft or bend three the connection between the control housing and the shaft what is a good way to reinforce the tubing and keep a lightweight construction use a smaller tube inside the other to provide added strength fill the tube up with casting material use bends to reinforce the tubing heat and temper the tubing so it becomes tougher another way not mentioned here stop the video and choose one what I used and probably the easiest answer here is to pour casting material inside the tubing but how do you contain the casting material in the tube and prevent it from moving or leaking I say probably because there are many ways to skin a cat so to speak put a rag in the end of the tube and pour the casting liquid down the tube cut some round pieces of rubber and use them to contain the casting liquid in the tube jam the tube in the ground to plug it with dirt and pour the casting liquid down the tubing use some gap filler in the tubing to contain it it will be fine without reinforcement some other way not mentioned here stop the video and choose one that question is probably best answered by number four you can use casting material to reinforce certain areas if you're going to use a larger search coil it's a good idea to put holes in it to, to hold it in place put tape over it to stop it from leaking out and allow it to set you can apply some expanding foam to plug the tubing and contain the casting material but you must wait at least 15 minutes before you pour the material in otherwise it will simply dissolve the foam and spill out but you can use any method that won't leak there are kits you can buy on the internet and for the most part they will work providing you think the process through first but I will present what I think is a better way of solving the problem using a very durable cheap and practical materials being readily available as an added bonus in fact you can buy it from most hardware shops so how can you make a detector from bits of water tube glue and end cap there are many problems for starters the battery compartment must fit snug be easily accessible and no potential for moving wires etc circuit board must be safely enclosed in the housing but accessible in case something goes wrong during construction and it needs repairs the wire that joins the loop to the circuit board must not have the capacity to be easily pulled out all joins must be strong and unbreakable the battery compartment must be separate to the circuit board while fitting neatly into the control housing they both must also be accessible and sealable preferably watertight there must be easy user access for the detector controls audio and switch it should have a comfortable well fitted hand grip and correct size elbow support it should also be paintable with a good quality durable paint and finally you may need to accommodate lithium ion batteries and have a 240 volt adapted lithium ion charger because pulse induction detectors are very hungry for power and can drain you ever ready energizer batteries in around one hour starting off with the detector length adjustment the only practical way to adjust the length of the tube is to have one slide inside the other but they must be exactly the right diameter and fit snug otherwise there will be slop at the end of each swing well fitting tubes like that are almost impossible to find unless they have been specifically made for that purpose so what is the easiest and most practical solution to that problem use a detector kit you purchased from the internet use an extendable painters pole use an extendable walking stick 
Maybe use a pipe joiner. Use a clip lock system like most detector manufacturers. Use any system which works. Stop the video and choose one. I believe there are two answers here. Number six, any system which works. But the simplest solution I found is number four, use a pipe joiner. The parts are easy to obtain, work well and make a very strong and lightweight adjustable connection once cut and glued in place. Most detector manufacturers use specifically made tubes and a simple springy metal clip which fits inside the smaller tube which locks to the outside tube through holes. Simply push the clip in, adjust the length and let the clip lock again. A very elegant solution I must say. But there is another way and there are many possible solutions to that problem. But many of them open up many new sets of problems. This way you can simply go to the hardware store, buy a pair of plastic water tubes which slide into each other and a tube joiner. Cut the tube joiner in half, file or grind the end to fit inside the larger tube and glue it in. There you have a strong, waterproof, durable and adjustable twist lock connection between the two tubes. But what about the handle and elbow support? Should you go for a bend in the tube or use a straight shaft? If you bend the main shaft instead of using a straight shaft, it can be used like the one in this picture. You will have warping issues however. In other words, it will be hard to get your bends to line up straight and it will flex a little unless you reinforce it somehow or use a strong rust resistant metal. But you can use a plastic straight shaft and reinforce the elbow rest. Straight shafts are more aesthetically appealing and potentially stronger. The last thing you want on a metal detector is a wobble when you are swinging. Simply mark the spot with a permanent marker Drill a hole in the tube to fit the smaller tube. Block off the main tube at both ends with expanding filler or something that won't leak. Hold the smaller tube on a comfortable angle with some tape or clamps. Then pour in enough resin through the handle to hold the tube in place until it is set. And there you have a strong, durable handle. Fortunately, bicycle grips are a nice snug fit on the 25mm outside diameter tube. You can use a cutout piece of the larger 100mm tube for the elbow rest, control housing and stand and then pop rivet it to the shaft later. Now we'll move on to the control housing. The control housing should have access to the batteries and hold the circuit board secure. But how can we do this? Glue or bolt the circuit board into a well fitting piece of plastic support. Place rivets or a small screw under the support so it can slide forward. Glue the board in place inside the control housing. Tack it in position with glue and pop rivet the circuit board in place from the outside. Or none of the above. Stop the video and choose one. I think the best answer here is number one. Glue or bolt the board into a well fitted piece of plastic support. Place rivets under the support so it can slide out forward. But don't put any glue or bolts in spots which will potentially damage the circuit board if you need to work on it later. You also need to easily slide the board out to solder the wires to the search coil. Once you have drilled the holes for the on and off switch, trim pot and headphone jack. You should also ensure that the piece of plastic you attach to the circuit board holds the battery pack nice and snug and have a sound battery pack connection. I use Perspec cutoffs, but be aware that Perspex tends to crack when you try to drill holes in it. The picture here shows one way to do it. Note that the headphone jack is outside the housing and in the stem and not shown in this picture. This design is not waterproof for obvious reasons. I bought the headphone jack and battery connector from the local JCAR electronics store. Battery pack and charger were ordered over the internet from China. The circuit board from England in kit form, but that'll come in a later video. The trim pot and on and off switch can be positioned, drilled and held in place with the nuts supplied. 
This is for easy user control and also to hold the board from sliding out from the front. Don't forget to drill a hole at the back for the coil wire to enter. Tie a knot in it to stop it from pulling out and you have a connection sorted and the only thing left now is the painting and assembling of the parts as shown. Always use heat shrink on any soldered or bare wires. Use a good paint and follow the directions on the can and you can't go wrong. Except to say that too much at once will cause runs and some paints stick better than others. Plastic coat paint is pretty good. Pop rivets the parts and glue the handle and elbow padding together like shown in the picture and the detector is finished. Correct size pop rivets are very good and quite strong in plastic but are problematic if you need to remove them so try to get it right the first time. Next part of the video will deal with the circuit board, battery pack and controls but for now I will leave you to ponder one question. What is the good of using a light in a search coil? Could it be useful for the hearing impaired? Could it be used in combination with audio to get a clearer picture of what's beneath the ground? Could it be used as a visual aid for pinpointing? Could it be used to seal the electronics and eliminate headphones for underwater use? All of the above or none of the above? Stop the video and choose one. The answer is all of the above. These circuits from England are very clever and powerful, but they are tricky to get to work and even trickier to make them work right, especially to somebody who's new to electronics, but it can be done with some perseverance. Believe it or not, there is not much difference between a circuit that works well in a salty environment and one which works well in mineralization, even though to a detector they are worlds apart. Yeah, listen. Oh. Oh, can you hear that or is it yeah. one speaker? Can yeah, you can hear it. Even metal detector manufacturers modified proven old designs for their new detectors. I like to describe these circuits from England as being like a two-speed four-stroke engine. Off and flat out. Get it right and the performance will blow you away. But one mistake and the whole thing will self-destruct along with all your work. Unless you are good at electronics and fault finding. I certainly am not. Electronics is a profession all on its own and you could say that the people who design and work in this area are the elite. So please don't email me because you can't get the circuit to work as I can't help you. I have tried to cover all the information needed to build a decent high quality detector in this video but I won't be held responsible for mistakes not in my control. But I can give you some very interesting insights from my experience as a novice. Once you learn from this video and with some experience you will find the door to creating the perfect detector is a lot closer. By the way I have never used a perfect detector. They all have faults. Our modified gold finder is very close and will drift from wet sand to dry without a murmur while picking out a small ring size object at a very decent depth in bad ground. And it has an unbeatable audio as well. But some of the Australian golf fields area will push the limits of even the most sophisticated and expensive detectors in the world. I believe that when the oscillation frequency of gold is established, then ultrasonics may provide a better alternative to using magnetic field pulses. But for now, the pulse induction detectors are definitely the best at penetrating difficult ground. I recommend you read How to Build a Surf PI 1.2 Pulse Induction Metal Detector from a DIY kit at this address. Before you consider purchasing the kits from Silver Dog Shop. Now we'll move on to building the circuit board. The first thing you need is a good set of eyes or a good magnifying glass. A fine point soldering iron, small cutters and the thinnest solder you can get. I use a 0.8 resin core. But remember, if it contains lead, it will solder a little better, but it will be bad for your health. All of the components are labelled on the circuit board and on the parts themselves. 
but a solder mistake is very difficult to fix. One of the first things you must do is make sure that if you solder one group of parts in, you won't accidentally fill another part hole in, or join two together, which are meant to be separate. Recommend using a solder sucker from the electronic shops if this happens. It's a good idea to group the parts like shown, but remember that the picture shown here is not 100% correct and that there are some missing components as well. As you separate the parts from each group, keep them separate from the others, as you might forget what you were looking for and potentially put a part in the wrong spot on the board. As you are placing the parts in their correct spot, you may want to bend the wires coming out of the back to stop them from falling out when you turn the board around. The soldering iron should touch the board first, then melt the solder on the board and a small amount of solder is placed to complete the join. Now I'm going to present you with a problem. Take a look at the picture and try to figure out what the potential problems are here. 1. Some of the parts are missing. 2. More than one integrated circuit has been put in backwards. 3. One of the integrated circuits have been soldered straight to the board. 4. The red resistors are put in the wrong places. 5. The capacitors are in the wrong way. Or 6. All of the above. Stop the video and choose one. The answer is 6. All of the above. Anything that can go wrong probably will, so read the instructions and make sure everything is correct before you solder them in. This integrated circuit has been soldered in without its DIN socket. Soldering should be done hot but quick. But the parts in the greatest danger of cooking are the integrated circuits and the transistors. I usually start with them first. You should remove the integrated circuits from its socket and solder the socket to the board as indicated by the markings on the board. Then carefully straighten out the leaks and push it into the socket evenly. This allows you to use as much heat to the solder as what you want. I use crock clips on the transistors between them and the board to help prevent it from overheating during soldering. I normally solder the parts with the largest legs second because they require more heat to solder properly. Strike while the iron is hot so to speak. These are the capacitors, large black resistors and the large transistor shown on the bottom picture here circled. Notice that the capacitor's longer leg is positive and that the board shows the correct placement of the components. This problem are the red resistors because they need to be placed in a group so they can be categorized and placed onto the board correctly. The rest are a process of elimination but do not allow any metallic parts to touch another component as a short circuit is a surefire way to destroy your work when you hook the power up later on. Always keep the iron tip clean and tinned with solder. Use a damp sponge to keep contaminants off the tip. Wait for the board to heat up and melt. Apply a little bit of solder and wait for it to spread. After a set of components have been soldered in, it is helpful to cut all the ends of the components close to the underneath of the board so you can get to the others without wire obstacles getting in the way. Take a good look at this picture. Which solder joint do you think is the most sound? One, two, or three. Stop the video and choose one. The answer is three. Number one is a dry solar joint that hasn't fused. The crater on the top is a dead giveaway. Number two has had too much solder and might not have had enough heat to fuse properly. Number three shows that the solder has willingly flowed and fused to the board and the component. Here is another scenario for you to consider. You have just finished the circuit board and realize that there is no sound. So you reverse the wires in the headphone jack to see if there is any sound. And while you are doing this, the power wire metal clips touch each other for an instant. What will happen? Besides the fact that there is no audio hookup in this picture. Nothing, as the power wires and the battery bear the brunt of the power drain. The circuit can't work because there is no power. The circuit will self-destruct, a part will be damaged, 
The circuit will no longer operate at all. Stop the video and choose one. The answer is number four. A part will be damaged and will probably lead to the damage of many other components if it's not isolated and replaced immediately. The lesson here is to use something to stop the parts from touching each other. I use blue tack to hold the board while I'm testing and hot melt glue or silicon to stop the components from touching each other. But I am told that the circuit will run better if the components are soldered while touching the board. This will eliminate the possibility of parts touching each other but increase the risk of cooking components. Speaker, power and trim pot solder joints are clearly marked on the circuit board. Cut some lengths of coloured wire to use for the hookup. Always use red for positive and black for negative. The coloured wires allow you to hook up these controls without confusion and can be cut shorter after the circuit has been placed in the housing with the battery pack. Use multicoloured crock clip wires and cut one end to solder to the board. Be aware that these points can easily be broken off the circuit board, so either be very gentle here or use hot melt glue to help prevent them from breaking off once you establish that the circuit is working. You now need to refer to the next video on how to make the search coil, or you can use another search coil as shown with the kit, which is more suitable for the Surf PI. Remember that the knowledge you learn from this video should serve as a guide only. I am sure there are people who will have no trouble standing on my shoulders. Be sure to check everything is in the right place and that there are no dry solar joins on the board before you hook up the power. It is a pretty hardy circuit but it can't tolerate some components in the wrong way or not connected properly, especially parts like small transistors. You can get good lithium ion batteries, holder and chargers from this address. Lithium ion batteries are by far the best to use when you need to have at least 11.5 volts and preferably a minimum of 8 hours of use between charges. Otherwise the circuit will go out of balance and it will be reflected in the audio with erratic behaviour. A simple but solid power connection is paramount. Never pull the plug by the wires as they will break. A simple plug like the one used here is ideal. Remember to solder the wires consistently. The red positive wire should always be soldered to the inside. Lithium ion chargers are specifically made to cut the power given to the batteries when it reaches a certain voltage. Otherwise the battery will be damaged. So always use the correct charger for them.